My name is Honor Sachs, and I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I am here at the Huntington Library on a year-long fellowship uh, for the 2023-2024 academic year. I'm writing a book that is a multi-generational family history of a family of enslaved people who sued for freedom claiming indigenous maternal ancestry. The Huntington has an, a, an enormous collection on Virginia Quakers from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so I came here to figure out just how the Quakers in Virginia were helping to facilitate uh, this, this sort of grassroots legal, legal uh, crusade. So I'm tracing about five, at least five generations of people um, who all claimed to descend from a woman named Judith, or a woman who was called Judith. That, I, that was a name that was given to her by her English captors, uh, who was captured in uh, 1704 um, in English raids on uh, the Spanish uh, mission towns in Appalachia, in uh, what was in Spanish Florida. Let's see, the, the critical period of, of litigation for this family starts just before the American Revolution. They first sue in 1772, or at least that's when the, the case is resolved by the courts in 1772. Um, the case files for that, ca for that particular case don't exist anymore. The only reason we have them, or have any knowledge of this case, is that Thomas Jefferson was really interested in the outcome of, of their case, because he had a couple clients as well who were suing for freedom through indigenous ancestry. That's, and the Huntington has you know, notations of Jefferson's memorandum books in which he writes down all of his, his, um, the cases he's working on. So he, he took notes, and we have those notes. Those notes still exist. All the cases in Virginia, um, how do I even tell this story? <laughs> The one thing I knew about Judith came from um, a manuscript that I found at the Library of Virginia. It was an uncatalogued file that was literally in their offsite storage in a box that, you know, you get asthmatic just opening it up. <laughs> so dusty and old. All the cases were wrapped in, you know, pages of newspaper in little tied in little bundles. They were about this big. And, you know, I opened it up. And there was a single mention in there, a witness was, had testified that Judith's da daughter, a woman named Jenny, had told him that her mother referred to herself as an Appalachian Indian. Or he, he misspelled it, it was Appalachia, like the mountains. But that little clue and the timing at which I realized she had been trafficked and sold in South Carolina as part of a larger diaspora, I was able to then trace back as well as I could to a massacre of the Appalachian in 1704 by the English, in which then the English took captive lots, I don't know exactly how many because the numbers are disputed, lots of women and children to South Carolina, where then they became plugged into this market of enslaved indigenous people. Then for, when Virginia, and, and Virginia slaveholders would come down and, and um, be really uh, active in this market. The Francis Coleman was part of that, that market. He came down uh, in the early 18th century. He purchased her for 25 pounds. Uh, she was 13 or 14 years old at the time. And, you know, when I started sort of, you know, b with this basic narrative and some names, you know, it just, there's more, there's, there, there were, I realized there were ways to actually find, find people um, that are, are not meant to be found. Um, you know, I'd see, see scholars discussing these cases, but they were always, individual cases, sometimes in the same paragraph, sometimes in the same footnote, but never recognizing that these were part of different generations or part of different branches of the same family tree. And so once I realized that they were all sort of part of a larger network, it made me think, well, you know, 
A, how, what are we doing wrong that we're not understanding the family connections between these legal ideas? But also, what does that mean about how enslaved people approach the law, right? If they're all trading uh, information through generations, across jurisdictions, and, then they, and, and amassing this, this, this paper trail um, that we've not acknowledged or even seen. I mean, when you think about it, it's really remarkable. Um, you know, the entire system of slavery as we know it in American history is that it destroyed families and that that, you know, and that therefore it's impossible to do enslaved family genealogy. And yet, um, you find examples of family being the thread that people, it was because it was so denied that the family legitimacy was so denied to enslaved people, that was the most critical thing that held them together. And so in ways, it's sort of, you know, family itself, the right to have a family became, at least for this particular group of, of, of people, um, a form of, of resistance against the institution.